Welcome everybody, it's time to get started. Um, my name is Marco and I'm in Austin, Texas right now. And uh, this webinar is for people who are bilingual and who have done some interpreting, um, but they wanna level up and understand a little bit of the theory behind it and how the job works so that you can be a better interpreter, whether you're doing it as a volunteer in a work setting, school setting, medical setting, religious setting, whatever it is, I'm hoping that everybody can pull some new uh, tricks out today and add it to your tool bag. Um, some of you are introducing yourself in the chat. I appreciate that. If you could get in, jump in the chat and tell us what your languages are and maybe um, what you do for a living. If you're a student, translator, interpreter, professor, um, sort of uh, what your connection is with the topic so that I can try to adapt my comments to your needs. I'm a mostly a Spanish interpreter. Um, I work in the court some. Yesterday I was in in a courtroom in the morning doing a, a interpreting for a family custody case in the Spanish and then in the afternoon for a um, an inmate uh, involving DWI. And uh, if you are interested in doing this for a job, uh, legal interpreting is pretty well paid. I uh, just uh, for information purposes, I know it's not polite to talk about money, but um, yesterday mm -hmm. I made $800 interpreting a total of about two hours. Wow. Um, most of the time I was just sitting around waiting for my case to be called, um, but you charge by the time that you're booked whether or not you're actually interpreting. So $800 for a day's work in my book is really good money. Oh, yeah. And you can't do that every day. You know, it depends on who books you and where and how many hours you work and, you know, what, what kind of uh, fees you negotiate. A lot of interpreting is um, is paid lower at like uh, 20 or $30 an hour in the United States and in other countries, of course, depends on the economy there. Mm -hmm. um, but this is a good job for bilingual people and I like to uh, help people find out about it and answer questions. And so if you have questions while I'm talking, you can put them in the chat and I'll try to answer them. If not, we'll have some time at the end um, for question and answers. And I want today to be very practical. Um, this isn't a high level um, translation studies. Um, it's uh, nuts and bolts how to do the job in the real world. And so first I will share my uh, PowerPoint, which I was actually working on in court yesterday between cases. And there's a good example of how you can get paid to do two things at once in this job. So the topic is interpreting basics for bilinguals. For some of you, a lot of this will be real basic. Oh, by the way, I am recording this and it'll be shared on YouTube. So if you don't want your image on YouTube, you can turn your camera off. If you leave your camera on, that's cool. I like feeling like I'm talking to real people out there. But the uh, points I want to touch on are translation versus interpretation, what those terms mean, the different kinds of interpreters or specializations, how to build your skills no matter um, where you are right now. Um, Meaning transfer, and that's just sort of a general term for uh, how you're going to get the meaning from language A to language B. Controlling the session, what you can do as an interpreter to direct traffic. And then the career roadmap, how you can um, advance uh, wherever you are right now and um, get further into the profession of interpreting. So first of all, translation is written and interpreting is spoken in a nutshell. Um, also, sign language interpreters. Um, are the other kind of interpretation, though I don't know ASL or any of the sign languages, so I'm not really qualified to comment on that. Um, there are some, anecdotally, I would say, since I do translation interpretation, I can say anecdotally, I feel like translation is more introverted, meticulous work where you're focused uh, in a little room by yourself, staring at your computer and researching terms and trying to get just the exact turn of phrase. And it's um, asynchronous. You get an assignment to translate, and then you can do it on your own time, which often means staying up late at night and working on weekends. And there's more competition because it's easier to outsource translation uh, globally. Uh, interpreters, um, are, it's more like uh, you're performing before a live audience, like a singer or a musician. Your people skills become more important. And um, not always, but often you can earn more as an interpreter while you're working. The challenge is just to book up enough of your calendar with interpreting jobs. So different kinds of interpreters, um, and this picture is of an ASL interpreter. Um, they are allowed to be very expressive. In fact, that's part of the, the language is your expressions for spoken language interpreters. We're supposed to keep it more deadpan. 
um, not try to uh, mirror the emotions of the person whose message we're transferring. So a okay, community interpreter um, is often where people start out. They may be in a school setting, uh, social services, like helping somebody get um, food stamps or Medicaid. Um, some of this is escort interpreting, where let's say a refugee has moved to your city and you follow her around to different apartments and help her understand how to use uh, the stores here and public transit. Um, there are also medical or healthcare interpreters, and you can get certified in this in the United States. And I imagine in other countries, some of you who are joining us from overseas, you can let us know what the certification systems are like there. Um, medical and healthcare interpreters uh, may be in person at a clinic or a doctor's appointment or a hospital, or more and more they appear remotely through video conferencing or telephonically um, through a speakerphone. Court or legal or judiciary interpreters are really three names for closely related kinds of interpretation that have to do with the legal system. Conference interpreting um, is almost always uh, simultaneous, meaning you'll be sitting there somewhere in a conference room listening, usually over headphones, to somebody speaking, in my case, speaking in English, and then I'll be speaking into a microphone and interpreting into Spanish at the same time. So there's a slight lag between what I hear and what I speak, but it's those two mental tasks going on at once. That doesn't come naturally to anyone. That's, that's not a, a skill we, are, we develop outside of uh, simultaneous interpretation. And so conference interpreters tend to uh, have more specific training. You can get a master's degree in conference interpreting, and then you may work for an organization like the United Nations or um, traveling around and doing the circuit of international conferences. Those are sort of the um, top of the pecking order in the interpreting world. You can also describe your interpretation work as either remote or on site, depending on whether you're going there face to face with the people. And now that the pandemic is uh, lessening, we're doing more on site interpreting again. And team versus individual interpreting. If it's a short session, um, like a one hour hearing in court, I will just go and appear by myself and I'll be the only interpreter. But if it's going to be a full day trial, um, then it's important to have a second interpreter there, also in my language, um, and we just switch back and forth so that uh, we can back each other up and give each other breaks because it's such intense mental activity, you can't just do it for eight hours straight, you'll turn into a pile of mush. And then spoken versus sign interpreting also, um, but I'll be sticking with uh, spoken language interpretation today. Uh, interpreting can be broken into modes, and there are several modes, but the two primary ones that most assignments call for are simultaneous and consecutive. And like I mentioned before, simultaneous just means somebody is speaking in language A and you're interpreting in language B right afterwards. A consecutive interpreting means it's sort of like a, a tennis match where the tennis ball is being hit back and forth. One person speaks in language A, you interpret into language B. The other person speaks in language B, and you interpret back into language A. And so most people start out with consecutive interpreting. That comes more naturally. If you grew up in a bilingual family, for example, and you had to interpret for relatives when they came to visit, um, meeting people, going shopping, then that would have been consecutive interpreting. Um, but if you find yourself interpreting, let's say um, you're at a religious service and you're the only bilingual person and you're trying to interpret for somebody who doesn't understand the language of the speaker, even if you're just sitting next to them whispering, but you're whispering while the speaker is talking, then that will be a kind of simultaneous interpreting. And then uh, the third one that we use in court is called sight translation. And sight translation means someone gives you a sheet of paper written, for example, in Spanish. Let's say it's a handwritten affidavit. I look at the Spanish and I read it aloud as if it were in English. And so that's sort of a hybrid of translation and interpretation. Some people call it um, sight interpretation. Some call it sight translation because it's really both. But whatever the mode and the type of interpreter you are, these are some skills that are common. And I chose the picture of the cat staring at the laser because we have to be laser focused on listening to the person who's speaking. That's really one of the biggest surprises for um, beginning interpreters. They realize, I don't really pay that close attention when somebody's talking. And you have to train yourself to focus and listen and to make sense of it because if you don't hear it, you can't interpret it. If you don't understand it, you can't interpret it. So you have to be fluent in the language and have a knowledge of the topic that's being discussed. Let's say you're a medical interpreter and they're talking about emphysema. You have to know some terminology related to emphysema so you can 
follow the concepts. Unfortunately, um, if it's a doctor talking to a patient, she'll probably be using simple language that's easier to interpret. Um, you have to be able to listen intently and focus. Uh, your short and long-term memory are important. Long-term memory when it comes to memorizing terminology and grammatical constructions and equivalence between the two languages. And uh, short-term memory when it comes to remembering what you just heard so that you can convert it into the other language and spit it back out. You have to have translation skills. And by this, I mean sort of globally, just um, converting one language to another, you could call that meaning transfer skills. Um, translation, I try to use it just for written, um, written documents. And actually, translating written text is a great way to improve your interpreting and vice versa. If you're mostly a translator, you should dabble in interpretation because it'll help um, loosen up some neural pathways in your brain that make it easier for you to translate quickly. And if you're mostly an interpreter, you should dabble in translation because you'll find that it builds up your understanding of complex grammar and it builds your vocabulary. Also, most interpreters need to be good at note taking and that's not comprehensive note taking. That's just uh, main ideas, a couple of key words from each sentence, lots of abbreviations and symbols. And that's most important in consecutive interpretation where people are speaking in long segments. They're not giving you enough time to go back and forth just from memory. If uh, in my case, if I'm in court and the judge speaking Spanish asks the witness, I mean, the judge speaking English asks the Spanish speaking witness something through me, the judge might say, uh, what's your date of birth? And I turn to the witness and ask in Spanish, what's your date of birth? And because that's a number, I'll grab my notebook. I always have a notebook and a pen in front of me, and I'll write down the numbers because numbers are kind of abstract. And if they give you several numbers in a row, it's hard to remember. So numbers and proper nouns um, are important to write down. And then um, main ideas from sentences. And there are entire courses you can take just on note taking for interpreters. A technology, there is some technology that um, becomes important, especially in consecutive interpreting. It's, it's wireless audio equipment uh, where you listen um, and you're able to turn up the volume in the speaker's language and then you interpret um, into a microphone that goes out through a transmitter in the listener's language. And usually the interpreter is just given a case full of these transceivers and you have to check the batteries and wipe them off and sterilize them and then pass them out to people who are coming for the conference or whatever the meeting is. So if you do sort of um, simpler consecutive interpretation as a volunteer or in a community setting, there's probably not going to be any um, technology involved other than your smartphone and uh, pen and paper. And the smartphone is to look up um, terms that you don't know. On an app like uh, DeepL or Google Translate or a dictionary on your phone, though, of course, um, Anybody who's bilingual and has used those apps much knows that they don't always get it right. And so buyer beware. And then finally, attitude. An interpreter needs to be curious and always willing to learn new things. Um, be confident because you're standing up in front of an audience. Sometimes you have to be tenacious. Uh, it gets exhausting and you have to keep on going. And then being cheerful just helps in that um, you're often in a stressful situation, let's say you work at a school and they call you in to interpret for the parents and the principal and the special ed teacher and a, an attorney um, at some controversy involving a student special ed program, there was probably be a lot of uh, tension and stress there. And the more cheerful and positive you can be, the more it helps people relax and just communicate and focus on the problem and not on misunderstandings. So I'm going to do three slides here that are all skills building for the three different modes, the, the primary modes, consecutive, simultaneous, and sight. And um, I would start with consecutive because that's the, the most natural interpreting mode. And YouTube and podcasts are the uh, best way to, for free to work on your consecutive skills. Find sample recordings on topics that you are interested in or that you may be interpreting in. Um, let's say you work at a, um, in a doctor's office, you would find um, recordings on um, medical subjects. Or if you um, work at a school, try to find uh, videos that, uh, were, that are recordings of actual school functions. There's so much on YouTube now. I didn't have that when I was doing my interpreting studies and 
Um, it's a great resource. So you listen to the sample recordings. Um, if I were practicing for court, exam for example, so I'm a court interpreter, I would find uh, a recording of an actual English courtroom or of a Spanish courtroom that both be useful. And I would just play the audio for a sentence and then use a space bar to pause it. And I would just repeat it in the same language. So the judge says, um, uh, you may call your next witness. And I pause it with the space bar and I say in English, you may call your next witness. And then I play it again. The judge says, um, so and so, uh, please uh, come up to the stand and uh, swear in. And I would pause it and say in English, so and so, please up, come to the stand and swear in. And that seems real easy at first but it's training you to pay close attention to focus and to strengthen your short-term memory skills. Then the next step is the counterintuitive one. This is weird. This is paraphrasing. So um, paraphrasing is a way to train your brain to go around um, individual words and think broadly in terms of meaning. So if, I, if the judge says, um, uh, the the next witness, um, Carlos Salazar, uh, is being brought in from detention. And so I would think the next witness, what's another way in English that I can say the next witness? I would say um, our following person who will testify, that's sort of a paraphrase of the next witness, will be brought in from detention, um, is going to arrive from a holding cell. So it's hard to paraphrase in English, but it's forcing me to think, what's a different way to say this? And this, is, this, this isn't going to make sense at first, but it becomes super useful later on when you're trying to think of how do I say that in my other language? Um, I don't know the word for, for detention. Uh, detention. You know, like, what, what is detention? I, it's something to do with jail. If you can think it's something to do with jail, it's a place where they hold people. What are synonyms for that? Prison, Cell, penitentiary, lockup, um, the slammer, you know, going more formal and less formal. Um, yes, with idiomatic expressions, it becomes so handy too. If somebody says some, some weird uh, uh, phrase like ducks on a June bug, she was on him like a duck on a June bug. If you're from the southern US, you might have heard that. Um, if you can say, what's another way for being on him like a duck on a June bug? Well, it kind of means following really close to somebody and not letting him get away. Oh, I know how to say in Spanish, follow real close to somebody and don't let him get away. So you sort of um, remove the confusing word and you find a way to get around it by paraphrasing. So you don't have to do a lot of paraphrasing. It's just a, a way to sort of uh, warm up your brain and make it more flexible. It's like yoga for the brain. Then you, um, you're ready to go on to your second language. So in my case, let's say I'm playing English audio. I'll pause it. As often as I want to, I can pause it after three words when I'm first getting started, but eventually you'll pause it after a whole sentence, maybe pause it after two or three sentences, work your way for 30 seconds. And then in the pause, I'll interpret into my other language. So I hear blah, 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 blah. And once my memory fills up, I'm like, okay, I can't take any more. I'm scribbling notes real fast. I'll pause it and I'll say it in Spanish. Or if I'm listening to Spanish, I'll pause it and I'll say it in English. Um, but I will give myself the luxury of looking up anything I want. And so I'll stop and I'll check something in my online dictionaries here and I'll write notes. Okay, this is how I'm going to say that. And I'll use the notes copiously as a crutch. Then once I'm comfortable doing that, I'll go back and play the audio again. And without looking at the notes, maybe closing my eyes, I'll try interpreting it into the other language. And eventually, at first, that's hard, and eventually it gets easier and easier. And as you build up this um, fluency on the, this is all one recording, by the way. This is uh, one segment of a hearing I found on YouTube or whatever recording you're listening to, a podcast, an audio book. It can be uh, a, a news report that's interesting to you. I'm just going back to the same thing again and again, and it may feel like cheating. You're like, oh, I already did this seven times. I've been doing this one all week. Um, it's, it's not a challenge anymore. Once it's no longer a challenge, you're ready to go on. But if it's still challenging, then do it again. Um, because those the habits and the vocabulary are seeking, sinking deeper into your long-term memory each time. So um, once you have mastered one recording, then um, you can play it faster with YouTube, for example. You can play at different speeds. You can start at 50% speed, 75% speed, 100% speed. and as you improve your consecutive interpretation, you'll be able to go faster and with longer audio segments on a, a broader variety of topics, starting from basic topics to more advanced and complicated ones.
question from the chat. How would you handle curse words from a witness ethically and legally in legal interpreting um, when somebody swears in their testimony or like in a video that we're watching, um, the interpreter is supposed to come up with a term that is equivalently offensive in the other language, which is hard to do because sometimes um, people who are buddies will use real bad language with each other because that's just how they talk. Like they're talking tough to their, their buddies. And then if you try to interpret it to in a, this formal setting in a courtroom, it's easy to make it either too offensive or not offensive enough. And so profanity is, is always a challenge for interpreters, but you have to, you have to try to make it as offensive as the original as best you can, because if somebody says, um, I punched him in the face because he use this really bad word, and then they say the bad word, and it is a really offensive word, but when you interpret it, you, you tone it down because you're embarrassed at the profanity, then the, the message is lost in the transfer. Um, the jury doesn't get to hear how, how offensive the term was. Would one use profane words? Yes. Um, in court interpreting, you have to use profanity as, as needed when it comes up. So, in fact, uh, there's a, an urban legend of an interpreter who was threatened with jail because she wouldn't, she was embarrassed at how bad the profanity was and she wouldn't interpret it strong enough. And the attorney objected and the judge said, you have to interpret that profanity or I'm going to lock you up. And um, I don't know how that ended. It probably never happened. But that's the story that <laughs> interpreters tell each other. So simultaneous, this is the second mode we're talking about. Remember, simultaneous is learning to listen and speak at the same time. So first you start with a process called shadowing. Shadowing just means repeating in the same language. So if I'm going to work on my Spanish shadowing, I'll play a recording of a trial in Spanish, and I'll maybe I'll set YouTube if they're speaking fast, like they do in certain countries, maybe I'll set YouTube to 75%, so it's a little easier. And I'll just let them talk, and I'll repeat everything I hear. So they're saying um, uh, here. I'll read this letter. Uh, to extend your CMBL registration, you will need to access the controller's new online Texas vendor registration system. So as I'm hearing this, as soon as I hear a word, I'm trying to repeat the same thing. To extend your CMBL registration, you will need to access the controller's, controller's new online Texas vendor registration system. And you'll quickly find that it's hard to listen and speak at the same time. You you have to, I, I think that you actually have to grow new neurons um, and connections to um, because our brain, brains are plastic and they, they actually rewire themselves as you're learning new skills. And so it may take weeks or months to get to the point where you can just shadow confidently at full speed in the same language. Then um, the next step in interpreter training is um, shadowing with a longer and longer gap between what you hear and what you say. That's called the decalage. Um, and if you can... Uh, follow further and further behind, it gives you longer time to analyze the whole sentence and rearrange the grammar so that it makes sense. Like, you know, some languages will put the adjective first and then the noun, and some will put the noun first and then the adjective. And if you start interpreting too soon, like you'll be saying the noun before you realize, oh, the adjective should have come before that. And so the longer you can wait before repeating it, the more um, accurate and fluent your output will sound. So this is, um, I'm necessarily summarizing like a whole year's worth of content here into this one slide, so bear with me. Um, then uh, once you are comfortable with shadowing, um, you interpret the same audio, you play the recording again, and you pause it as needed, and you try to interpret it into the other language. This will involve looking things up, making a little glossary, taking notes, maybe even transcribing the whole thing in the first language, and translating the whole thing to the second language if it's too complicated to do in your head. Um, but you start weaning yourself away from the crutch of the written content. Even if you have memorized it by the end of this um, exercise, if you do it day after day, you, you may find that the content um, becomes really familiar. That's okay. That's part of the process. So um, you we, wean yourself away from the written version. You wean yourself away from the, the pause button until you're able to go through the entire session, let's say you're going to start with a three-minute recording, a three-minute audio, and you build your way up to a five-minute audio, and then an eight-minute audio, and a ten-minute audio. Eventually, you want to get to the point where you can do like a half-hour audio um, in simultaneous, um, because that's what a conference interpreter will do, maybe half an hour, and then trade off with the partner. But that takes 
may take months or years to reach that point. Um, so you play the audio faster until it's full speed, you play longer recordings, um, you add more topics with more complex uh, sentence structure and vocabulary, and then you just repeat it daily. It's like a, an exercise regimen. If you're training for a marathon, you have to run every day and then cross train, and you're really doing the same thing with your brain and your ears and your tongue. Um, you're building them up to be something much stronger and more flexible than they were before. And you record yourself and you review your own performances. Often you'll get to the end of a session and think, like, I did great. And then you play the recording that you made of yourself and you just listen to what you were saying and you realize, oh, I skipped something there. Oh, I, I, um, that's not actually what he said in the original. And you can sort of uh, evaluate your own performance. Or if you're working with a partner, your partner can give you feedback. So the third mode that we're going to cover is sight, sight translation, or sometimes sight interpretation. Um, the ways that you practice this are you uh, gather documents um, of the kind of um, material that you might be asked to sight translate. And you first just read it in the original and try to make it smooth and clear, kind of like imagine a, a radio announcer reading the news report so that it's easy to understand. Um, then I would recommend you translate it in writing. Just set it down and take a pen and paper or a keyboard and write the whole thing out in the other language that you're interpreting into. Look up anything you need. Use machine translation if that's helpful for you. But then take the translation and read that out loud. Try to just make it as smooth and comprehensible and clear, enunciate, um, so that anybody can hear you, even if they maybe speak a different dialect of the language or they're not used to your accent. And then finally, um, without looking at your translation, just looking at the original, try to read it aloud at the same rate and the same um, accuracy as if it were written in that language. And again, record yourself. You can use a smartphone app. Most come with those now. And then play it back and ask yourself, does this sound like I was reading aloud in the actual language that I was speaking? Or is this, are there a lot of uh, pauses and gaps as I fumble for words? So I'm going to take a little pause right here and ask you if you would go in the chat, um, tell me, um, have you interpreted in the consecutive? Um, have you interpreted in simultaneous? Have you done site translation? Just put in, put in the chat the modes that, that you've done before. Consecutive site, thank you. And if you haven't done any interpreting yet, then that's fine. I'm just curious whatever, where everybody's at. Simultaneous, all right. Consecutive, consecutive site, all three. Consecutive and site, good. Consecutive and simultaneous, all three. Some people like one mode a lot and don't like other modes. Um, I like them. I like them all. I think that it's interesting to do a variety. Um, but sometimes uh, consecutive is um, hard because people will be, will, won't be pausing enough and you have to take lots of notes and you're afraid of you're forgetting things. Um, sometimes simultaneous, you feel like you sort of get in a flow and like I almost have this out of body experience, right? I just feel like the, the language is flowing through me and that's cool. Simultaneous translation site, prefer simultaneous, yeah. And if you, if you have to test to get some credential or certification, you'll probably find that you're a lot better at one. You don't have to practice that so much. And then and there's one that you're bad at and have to put a lot of time into that. Consecutive is hardest. Yeah. If you do a lot of uh, simultaneous interpretation, then consecutive does, does get hard. Okay, cool. So um, this, this is sort of a catch-all slide. I wasn't sure what to call this. At first, I called it translation, but I changed it to meaning transfer. These are just some general rules of thumb. That's what the big thumb's doing back there. Um, two general ideas I want to uh, leave you with is that um, this is an art. It's not a science. And you'll, you'll meet people who are super prescriptive, who have a big set of rules about the right and the wrong way to do interpretation and translation. And, and that's just not my perspective. I think human language is created by communities that just by consensus decide how the language will evolve and what will be the normal way that they say things and understand things. 
And by participating in that culture, we get more and more familiar with the unspoken rules for how people communicate in that language. And um, it's, it's an art. Um, there's a little bit of science in there, but it's mostly art. Um, it's a form of uh, sharing ideas, getting an idea out of one person's head and getting it into another person's head that it otherwise would not be able to reach. There's always more than one way to say it. There's always more than one synonym that will be okay in that situation. So try to break free from individual words. Try to step back and think about the image or the, uh, the dynamic that's going on. If you get hung up on one word, like people come up to me sometimes and say, hey, how do you say this word in Spanish or in whatever language? And if I don't know how to say that exact word, I'll think, well, what's sort of a related word in my source language? I can go sideways, come up with a synonym, and then, oh, I do know how to say the synonym in the language. And I'd say it's something like this. And in most situations, that's good enough. If you're trying to preserve as much meaning as you can. Something always gets lost in translation. There's no one-to-one -one equivalent between any two languages unless it's maybe numbers. Um, numbers, the language of math is, is the same, and maybe the language of music is the same. But, but words always have different nuances and connotations because of the cultural context. So remember the big picture, the context, and the purpose of this communication that you're trying to relay back and forth. And sometimes the loan word, like uh, Spanglish or whatever um, term you use in your language for borrowed words, calcs, sometimes are the right choice. For example, um, I have, uh, in, in my profession, there are people who will never use the word corte in Spanish when interpreting because they say, no corte, which is the cognate of court in English. Um, corte is uh, the, the king's court, like the king of Spain has a corte, a royal court. We're talking about a judicial court, and so you have to use tribunal or juzgado or some word like that. Um, and, if, and so when you take a, the court interpreting exam, you have to be careful not to use the word corte because that's just Spanglish, and you know we don't want to use this real informal word. But in Texas, where I interpret, everybody who speaks Spanish uses the word corte to mean a court. And so as an interpreter, I have to decide in what situations, yeah, that's another good example, in what situations am I, am I going to stoop to the Spanglish because there's like the high prestige dialect and the low prestige dialect, and in what situations am I just going to try to communicate in whatever idiolect the person is speaking in. And idiolect is the linguistics term for the dialect of a single person. So the way that I like to talk and the terms that I like to use and my mannerisms are all my idiolect. And if I'm interpreting for someone who uses the word corte for court, then I'm going to use that word personally. I feel like that's the clearest way to communicate the idea. Or if they use troca for truck, which is another Spanglish term, fine. I don't care. If that's their word, then I'm going to use that word so I can communicate with them. So that's a sort of a um, philosophical position that interpreters have to take. Yeah. There's some more good examples of um, Spanish as spoken in the United States. Uh, for also, there are professional considerations and ethics. Uh, in most situations, we avoid simplifying, summarizing, explaining, and omitting. There are exceptions if you're a community interpreter, where you're just trying to help somebody get access to social services or education, then there are plenty of times when it's okay to simplify and explain. Um, but we don't take sides. Uh, interpreters try to just interpret and not um, try to convince anybody by their choice of words. Um, the more you become an advocate, then the less you're actually transferring meaning and the more you're getting involved in the situation. And again, um, community interpreters have different rules than court interpreters and so forth. Um, but think about, am I being impartial in the way that I relay this message? Uh, you can advocate for somebody's needs, but the needs that you're advocating for are your needs to communicate clearly. For example, I need you all to slow down. I need you to give me these documents that you're looking at. I need you to speak up so that I can hear you. Um, it's generally not the interpreter's job to advocate for the uh, limited English proficient person in the context of the United States or in whatever country you are, the person who needs the interpretation. Um, be humble. Uh, learn. Uh, you're always learning on every assignment. I learn new things. Um, ask for feedback and then accept the feedback that people give you. Um, sometimes that's hard to do. And then know your language pair and direction. That means what two languages are you working in and also 
what direction are you more fluent? My first language is English. And so if I'm translating, I only translate into English. I can translate from French and Portuguese and Spanish into English, but I don't translate out into those other languages, written documents, because my written Spanish and French and Portuguese isn't as good. I, I say things in kind of an awkward way sometimes. I use odd word choices, and so it, it feels foreign to native speakers. Uh, if you're interpreting, though, you may find that you interpret better into your second language and worse into your first language. And so if you're interpreting consecutively, you have to go both ways. But if you're interpreting simultaneously, like in a conference setting, then you would probably um, choose to just uh, focus on the direction, on the language pair and direction in which you're most fluent. And over time, you develop fluency in the other direction as well. So in the background, I don't know if you can see it on your screen, but I have a, a traffic police officer because the interpreter does a lot of uh, traffic directing. Um, first, uh, what to ask in advance and take with you. Uh, you, no matter what kind of interpreter you are, you probably want to arrive on uh, early with a water bottle and a notebook and a pen. If you're a freelancer, some business cards to give out. Um, your glasses, if you wear them, um, a name tag, if you have it, if, and if you can get a make a name tag, that makes a big difference in the perception of professionalism by your clients. You want to know as much as you can about the session in advance. What are people going to be talking about? Are there any programs or printed materials or newsletters that I can look at so that I understand what's going on so that I can research terminology I don't know? I'm a medical interpreter, and this is the first uh, epilepsy appointment I've interpreted for. I want to know all the epilepsy terms so that I'm able to interpret those quickly when I get there. Then when you arrive, there's something called a pre-session, especially with medical interpreters, um, not so much um, in other kinds of interpretation, but it's always helpful to have a little bit of contact before you actually jump in and start interpreting. You want to establish rapport with the people who will be listening to your interpretation, introduce yourself, if it's a setting that confidentiality is important for, like an attorney-client meeting or a doctor-provider meeting, no, a provider-patient meeting, um, then you can tell them that everything you interpret will remain confidential, that you have taken an oath of confidentiality. Uh, you will often say, I'm going to be interpreting the first person. I'll be saying I and me in the voice of the person I'm interpreting for. So if the doctor says, I need you to uh, raise your left arm, then I will turn to the patient and say in Spanish, I need you to raise your left arm. The novice interpreter will often use a third person and turn to the patient and say, she needs you to raise your left arm. And the more you do that, the more confusing it gets for the speakers because they're not sure who she means and who I mean, and um, it gets confusing. They'll be like, wait, you need me to do that? Or the doctor needs me to do that? And so the uh, the general practice is to use the first person, I, and speak in the voice of whoever you are interpreting for at that moment. Uh, in a pre-session, like in a medical setting, you'll also say, I'm going to interpret everything. That means like uh, sometimes a patient will say, hey, I don't tell the doctor, but um, I just uh, you know, started taking drugs and I'm feeling kind of high right now or something that's confidential. Um, you want to let them know in advance, anything you say to me in the other language, I have to interpret into English for the doctor and vice versa. I can't, I can't just pick and choose what I'm going to interpret. Uh, speed, you want to mention, please maintain a moderate speed uh, and pause as necessary. I may need to interrupt you to pause or ask you to clarify or repeat things. And just laying all these ground rules out at the beginning is helpful because then people know what to expect and there's less of a chance that they'll get frustrated by the presence of the interpreter. It's hard for somebody who's not used to working through an interpreter to have to wait and be patient because it takes twice as long for consecutive to go back and forth. And so laying these ground rules um, help to sort of smooth those ruffled feathers. And then at the session itself, depending on what kind of interpreter you are, what mode you're interpreting in, you can use hand signals to ask people to pause. Um, there's a lot of, you know, I think in most languages, symbols like this mean hold on a second um, or slow down. You, can, you need to position yourselves where you can watch the people speaking. Um, seeing a person's face when they speak makes a huge difference, and just seeing their gestures helps you to understand the entire message. You can interpret what you can't hear. So if, they, if you're interpreting, say, at a, 
a church service and they put you away in the back corner and you can hardly hear anything back there, you're not going to be able to do your job. You have to either get um, incoming audio that you can turn the volume up on or move to the front where you can see and hear clearly. Ask for breaks as needed. Um, nobody can interpret, even, even the pros can interpret accurately for more than like an hour straight. Um, and the, the general professional rule is after 30 minutes, you should have a break or switch off with another interpreter. And that's because it's such intense activity. Your brain is working harder than anybody else in the whole, in the whole room. Like when they take an MRI of an interpreter, there's just these, it's like the 4th of July fireworks bursting all over because there's so much going on and it's really exhausting after a full day of interpreting, as some of you know, you'll come home and just collapse onto the floor because you're so drained. Sometimes I feel like it's not safe to drive home from court after I've been interpreting because I'm just so tired. It feels like my um, ability to drive is impaired. So maybe I should call an Uber. Uh, trade off with a partner if you're doing simultaneous and be honest about breakdowns in communication. That means if you weren't able to hear something, bring it to the attention of the client or the people involved or if um, People are using terminology you're unfamiliar with. Sometimes you'll have to ask for a break so that you can stop and uh, look something up or make notes and then at a break, go back and add that and let them know. Uh, the point is just that an ethical interpreter um, transfers as much meaning as she can and she is upfront about what she can't transfer so that the, the speaker and the listeners are aware of any possible uh, miscommunication. Got some questions here. What should the interpreter do if he wants to speak for himself in the middle of the session? Would he use the first person? Um, in the legal setting, uh, what we do, like let's say um, I need to interrupt people and say, wait, I couldn't hear that. Um, what I will do is I'll use the third person. Um, I'll say uh, the interpreter needs a repetition. Like I'll hold up my hand and everybody looks at you and they're like, what do you mean the interpreter? You are the interpreter, what are you talking about? first time it's confusing but then they the court reporters especially like that because if they're typing out everything that's being said then it's clear to them that the interpreter is speaking on his own behalf and not interpreting something that he heard in a medical setting I, I haven't done that for so long I don't remember what the protocol is I used to say the interpreter would like to make a comment yes um, as an interpreter we need to do the gesture as well um, as an interpreter, uh, in the legal setting, we are told not to gesture. Um, if the witness is shaking her finger like this and the interpreter shakes his finger the same way, that's considered to be um, mocking. Uh, and it can cause people to be insulted and it can be a distraction from the testimony. Um, if we assume that um, the witness who's shaking her finger is seen by everyone in the room, and they can all understand that what's said next in the interpretation was accompanied by a finger shaking in the original. There are some gray areas. What if she's doing a gesture that just means something in her language and it doesn't mean the same thing in English? The interpreter still doesn't interpret the gesture in the legal setting. Um, the lawyers who are asking the question should jump in and say, what does that gesture mean? And then, like in the sidebar, the interpreter might explain, oh, in our culture, this gesture usually means this, but I would have to confirm with her that that's what she meant. In a medical setting, uh, the interpreter raises her hand and says the interpreter would like to, yes. Is it necessary to start from consecutive if you want to do simultaneous only? No, no, you can jump right in and do simultaneous. It's just um, uh, consecutive is used in more places. Uh, there's more, I feel like there's more demand for consecutive and I think it's easier to learn consecutive than simultaneous. I know some of you will disagree, um, but if you just want to be a simultaneous interpreter, then you can start with that. That's fine. All right. So here's sort of a general career roadmap, a bird's eye view. Um, I would recommend if you want to proceed in your interpreting career or just get started. It starts with role playing. Find a study buddy, um, somebody who will go through scenarios with you and practice interpreting what they say. Um, if you want to interpret in a medical setting, find a medical interpreter. Interpreters are pretty nice and they usually don't mind if you follow them around and take notes and observe what they're doing. It's sort of flattering that somebody wants to 
shadow them at work. So find an interpreter of the kind that you're interested in becoming and shadow her and um, take notes and ask questions and get a feel for the protocol because it's not just linguistics, there's also this entire context of scheduling and um, practices and communication outside of the session itself. Um, volunteer and explore, try different kinds of interpreting, try simultaneous, try consecutive, try site, try conference, try community, try um, you know, meetings uh, in a business setting and just get a feel for what the different types of interpretation are like. And you'll probably start out as a volunteer. There's, there are a lot of opportunities for volunteer interpreting in contexts like uh, refugees and asylum seekers. Um, here in, where I live in Austin, Texas, there's a bi-monthly uh, legal clinic where attorneys volunteer their time and they meet at a public school in the cafeteria and people who can't afford to pay for an attorney but need legal advice for like a civil case where they can't get a court appointed attorney they'll come in and people just line up and take a number and then they go out to a table where an attorney sitting there and they ask their questions and if they um, don't speak English and there are volunteer interpreters there and the interpreters we have a name tag says like hi I'm Marco and I speak Spanish we go over and we interpret for those people and that's a great place to work on your uh, consecutive interpreting in a legal context. Uh, probably whatever elementary school is nearest you occasionally has parents who need interpretation in your language. You could go there and interpret for parent-teacher conferences or school board meetings, anytime the parents wanted to um, communicate with uh, administrators. Um, after you do volunteering and exploring, um, often the next phase, and this is different for each person, but often it's an additional duty at work. Let's say your um, job is doing customer service for a company and occasionally people come in who just speak Vietnamese and you're the only Vietnamese speaker in the office, then they will say, oh, as an additional duty um, without getting paid extra, we need you to interpret for these Vietnamese speaking clients. And that's fine, you'll build up your skills and then eventually you should be getting paid more for that um, special uh, and high value asset you bring to the company. Then you start freelancing for agencies. Agencies are companies that connect buyers of interpretation with um, contracted interpreters. And in Texas, for example, we have a couple big uh, interpretation agencies called Master Word Services and TIN, the Translation Interpretation Network, and then all kinds of national interpreting companies like um, Language Line Solutions and Lionbridge are two of the big ones. And anytime a company needs or an organization needs an interpreter, they will often call an agency first because they don't know where to start, and the agency does the project management piece and finds the interpreter, pre-qualifies the interpreter, sets up the assignment, um, pays the interpreter, bills the client, and does all of the administrative duties. And so if you're just getting started and you don't know who to interpret for that will pay you, um, register with the agencies. You can work for several agencies at once, sort of like um, you know driving for Uber and Lyft. You can drive for both of those companies and you just, as a job comes up, you take whichever one you want and go back and forth. It doesn't pay as well working for an agency. For Spanish in Texas, if I'm gonna interpret at a medical appointment, I haven't done this for a while, but I would expect to make like $30 an hour, um, maybe. Um, and if you're a medical interpreter, please get in the chat right now and tell us what agencies are paying these days for your language, like say Spanish, 30 an hour, 40, 50, or whatever language, I'm just curious. Um, if the same agency were sending me to a court hearing that required my legal credential, then I would expect them to pay me like, I don't know, $60 an hour, $80 an hour. Um, and so working for an agency, whether it's in person or over the phone or video conference, you get a, you're exploring all different types of interpretation. Your, your skills are developing broadly and they're doing the marketing and sales work so you don't have to. Um, the next uh, step after that is a lot of interpreters prefer to move beyond agencies to direct clients, and it depends on your situation, whether that's feasible. 
But a direct client means um, now instead of the court calling the agency that calls me and the agency keeps a third of the money, um, the court knows me and calls me directly. Now, if the court discovered me through the agency, I've signed a contract with the agency saying I won't cut them out and go to the court. But if the court did not discover me through the agency and wants to hire me directly, they might be able to pay me a little less and yet I still make more money and that's a good arrangement there if my language is in high demand. If I am an Arabic interpreter and they only need Arabic once a year in the city, it might not be um, worth it to them to track down the Arabic interpreter and set up that um, direct connection. They might just prefer to go through the agency for that. Depends on the, on the demand and the um, volume. But uh, I would recommend working your way up to direct clients eventually because you make more and you establish a relationship and you get more familiar with the needs of that client. Also, think in terms of what your next credential is going to be. Let's say you, okay, here we have some $15 an hour, uh, work from home, OPI. Jesse, OPI is um, oral proficiency interview? Or is that, is that one of the immigration? Oh, sorry, sir. Sorry, OPI is over the phone interpreting. Oh, over and the phone interpreting. Information, I just, um, I'm ready to, I'm about to do my test um, for CMI through NBCMI. And so it's funny because like I had sent in my interview, my application and I didn't hear nothing. And then I was also doing an application with the um, NBCMI board to try to do my test, to do my exam. And so in between, I was waiting for the interview. I got a call from or message from NBCMI that I could go ahead and take my test. So I went and did an interview on, um, with that company, and they said that the starting rate, like entry level, working from home, is fifteen dollars an, an hour, um, and that's basically um, you just have your high school diploma, um, minimal experience, and you know that's just like entry level, and you work from home. For me, like. I feel like it's a good place to get your foot in the door if you don't have a lot of experience, especially working from home. You don't got to pay gas. Yeah. Yeah, I started out interpreting for language line from home. I think it was $20 an hour back in 2000. See, that's funny because that's one of the companies that I had uh, interviewed with and, and that's, that's what they were paying was $15 an hour from home. So I don't know. And she did say that if you go on site, though, it, it is more. So it just varies on yeah. that. OK. And NBCMI is the National Board of Certified Medical Interpreters, something like that. OK, thank you. So set a goal for your next credential. Let's say you do a little bit of exploring, working for an agency, and you decide what I really love is simultaneous interpreting at uh, professional conferences for, you know, architects and engineers and so forth. That's challenging. And, and so I want to uh, become a conference interpreter. I'm going to research what um, college programs that I can take in conference interpreting and just decide my next goal is going to be this. Or if you're a court interpreter, say, okay, I've gotten my state court interpreting certification, but I want to go for federal. And it's going to take me a couple years of practice and training to get ready for that. But having that next credential um, in view uh, really helps motivate you to keep on studying and honing your skills. So this is a career for people who like lifelong learning, who like to keep on learning new words and new ideas every time. And I, lo I love doing depositions because every deposition I go to, um, it, there was an accident, either a car accident or an accident at work or something. And I learn at each deposition some way to, to, to crash or to get sued. And I'm able to avoid that in my own life. Like after one deposition where they had a, a, a dash cam on the truck, they were able to go back and watch the video and the driver got off because he was able to show from the dash cam that he hadn't run the red light or something. I went home and got on Amazon and ordered myself a dash cam. I mounted it in my truck and plugged it in. It's been there ever since. It's recording in a continuous loop because I thought, if I get in an accident and it's someone else's fault, I need to be able to prove it. And that's just one of the, the many things I learned as an interpreter. So this concludes my little presentation here. This is a picture of our staff as of a year ago. There have been some changes at Texan Translation. We are um, 
let me stop screen sharing. We are a local family owned business. I'm going to put some links here in the chat. Um, the, this is a free webinar, but if you'd like to show your appreciation and donate to a cause that I support, it's um, Asian Family Support Services of Austin. There's a link. They, they work in 29 different languages, helping immigrants who are victims of domestic violence. Uh, if you'd like to see this video, have it available when it posts, um, there's our YouTube channel. Um, I will also um, take the PowerPoint and put it in my blog. There's a link to the blog. If you want to pursue higher education interpretation, I've got a page with all the programs in Texas. And of course, there's lots outside of Texas that are good too. But most of these college programs you can do online without actually um, visiting the campus. And if you found today's lesson helpful and wanted to say something nice um, on our review page, that'd be cool. Something like great information, Marco's webinars are the best. That's the that's a little review link. So that's all um, I had to share. Thank you. Wow, lots of nice compliments here. But I'm I'm open to questions now, and I'll stay here for a while. Um, what questions do you have about interpreting? You can take yourself off mute and talk, or you can put them in the chat, whatever. Okay, Jesse, there's uh, the higher ed on translation link is the one I posted a minute ago. Uh, Maria Quintana? Yeah, yeah I'm actually K Carolina or Carolina. How are you, dear? Great, how are you? Good, sorry for getting too late. Um, I, and I, my question was uh, actually, uh, I, in 48 hours, I will be able to see the whole thing, the whole video, maybe on the ATA website. Um, I would love it if the ATA would put this on their website, but I don't have that kind of poll. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I'm gonna I, put, I'm gonna put it on my YouTube channel. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. So you said so. Can I um, get that? Uh, did you write it on the on the chat or? Yeah, let me, um, I'll, po I'll just post that link there because I put a bunch of links up. Um, here is my YouTube channel and probably I'll come in on Monday and post that. So look for it Monday afternoon. Okay, okay, Monday afternoon. Okay, that's yeah. good. Thank you. Check, thank check you. and tr translation, right? Yes. Right. Yeah, thank you. You bet. Mm -hmm. Oh, here's a question. Um, Daniela, can you type that? I can't hear you, Daniela. Please type instead. Um, Daniela, this, your sound will scramble. I'm sure that you tell the people you have a more that if they count you. you get paid. Maria, is that is that you talking? No. If you answer, it's definitely one of the two of us. Stop talking. Stop, 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 stop. Whoever's, yes. whoever's talking, I don't know who's talking, but we can't understand you. It's all scrambled. So wh whoever was talking, please type it. There's something wrong with the connection. Thank you. Sorry. There's a question here in the chat. Uh, info on ASL interpreting. I don't know anything about ASL, sorry. I would. Uh, I do. I do. Okay. I do. Please share. Okay. 
So what 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 do you want to know about LSA? That's language services associates. Is that what you were referring to? Um, American Sign Language. Oh no, I'm sorry. I thought you said language services associates. I'm sorry. No. No, no. no I apologize. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, back connection. I'm sorry. Same letters, different order. Right, right, right. <laughs> The, I know here in Austin, uh, the community college, you can study several years of American science. Hi, it's Daniel. Hi, Daniel. Uh, hi, I'm Daniel. Greetings from London. Um, thank you for a good uh, webinar. So it helped with me a lot. Well, I have one basic question about interpreting. As for me, well, I'm I'm University of Warsaw graduate, but I'm really into interpreting, especially a simultaneous interpreting. And I have one problem because uh, in the UK, I have to pay over ten thousand pounds to get a degree, and uh, of course, uh, I'm learning from Andrew Giller's books just on my own, four times four times per week. And I have maybe a stupid question: How should I start my career as a simultaneous or a, or a conference interpreter if I don't have any degree or or, um, or um, experience? Or do you know any to, to any private teachers or any degrees that cost less, for example, if I'm interested in, in, in such career? Can you give me any piece of advice if you know? Yes. Um, in, I don't, I've never lived in the UK, so I don't know what the uh, standards are there, but in the US, um, a lot of- Yeah, the, in general, I understand in general, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. In the US, a lot of conference interpreters are self-taught <coughs> and um, we, like in my case, uh -huh. I studied um, simultaneous interpretation with a, with a home study course. Um, the, the courses that I use are from Acebo. I'll put it in the chat here. Acebo is a program for Th legal Thanks. Services. And there's another one called uh -huh. uh, uh, Eberkana. Uh, they make self-study courses. And then the uh, University of um, Arizona. All right. Center for Interpretation. Mm -hmm. They make self-study courses. And mm -hmm. back when I got it, you got CDs in the mail. Probably not, now it's like MP3s you download or something. Right. You, you can study simultaneous interpretation on your own. And um, yes, Sheila's useful. Yeah. And, and then just start working at, uh, say, low end, for low end clients. The clients that don't pay so much yeah. because they're okay. nonprofit organizations, yeah. for example. But yeah, that's and my, uh, let you practice. And that. I have maybe, I have two maybe last questions. And I know it may it may be a bit stupid, but could you tell me honestly, uh, do you need to have a special, let's say, quality innate or inborn qualities to be a good simultaneous interpreter, or it, it can be definitely taught if you are determined enough? What's your opinion on that? Do you, do you have a talent or a, do you need to be predisposed for that or not necessarily? Because some people say that that in uh, when I was uh, uh, at the university, I was told that if you wish to be a good interpreter, you need to have something. Do you share that or it's or do you think that it's it, it can be definitely taught? Of course, as long as you are healthy and have uh, and if you are not hard of hearing, that, that that's an obvious thing. But what, what what's what's your uh, view on that? Beyond that, could you tell me, please? Yeah. That's, that's kind of a philosophical question. I would say, I would guess it's like 80% 80, 80 motivation and 20% uh, natural ability. Mm -hmm. I, I imagine there are some people whose right. brains handle interpretation better just because of um, how they, they grew. Like some people are more artistic and some people are more technical. Mm -hmm. I think it's about 80% how mm -hmm. much hard work you're willing to put into it. <laughs> Right and okay and the last question and uh, do you believe that there is a discussion discussion on the forum that do you believe that technology or artificial intelligence will place in interpreters in the future or do you, or it is highly unlikely I... because some for example let, let's 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 forget the translation because translates because i know that google can sometimes do really good translation to my surprise even google but in, do you think that in the in 50 years we can be replaced i mean interpreters by artificial intelligence or artificial intelligence or technology do you think that or it's I... very unlikely i wouldn't be surprised if the technology gets there eventually 
But when the technology gets to interpret as well as a person, it's also going to get to be as good of a teacher as a person, as good of a doctor as a person. It'll be able to do anything a person can do because interpreting involves the full spectrum of human communication. And so there's, you know, science fiction writers talk about the singularity as being the point in human evolution in which artificial intelligence surpasses human intelligence. If we reach that point and artificial intelligence surpasses us, it's going to be able to interpret as well as us too. But it's still a very theoretical point in evolution. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for us uh, for answering to my question. Thank you. Sure. Right now, the things that um, machines can interpret well, um, like even my Google Translate app, I can use it to ask very simple and straightforward questions in one language, and it will understand it and interpret to the other language. <coughs> But if I speak too long, or if I use humor, sarcasm, irony, figures of speech, mm -hmm. culturally bound yeah. concepts, um, uh, expressions, idioms, anything like that, it just mm -hmm. sort of breaks down and the, the app gets confused. So, so right now I feel very confident in trusting a human interpreter over, a, over an AI. So far they have not um, threatened yeah. our job. Yeah. All right. And is it true that it takes years to become a really, let's say, to become really good to, at conference interpret, interpreting? Is it true that it's the matter of years, not months, to be or not necessarily? Depending on where you start from. If you've been working yeah. in two languages your whole life and you have a translation mm -hmm. background, then um, adding interpretation to that uh, would be faster, but yeah. But professional conference interpreters do study for years. Right, right. It's usually a master's level program. Yeah, and sometimes when I when I do my interpreting, for example, consecutive for some speeches are easy to remember, but the others are very tough to remember. Is it quite normal that some speeches are easy easier for you to do, and sometimes and when you listen to, or depending on the speaker, sometimes when so sometimes uh, uh, the way how speaker organizes was is really tough, you know, to interpret, and sometimes it really uh, drives me crazy when I when when once I can remember everything, the other speech I remember almost nothing, you know. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes it's, when I use when I use speech pool, speech pool, uh, or uh, in EU we use speech repository, so that really good websites you can check there are lots of good exercises on that like speech repositories this is e european union website and speech pool yeah i take some i use uh, some exercises from that website that are really useful because sometimes the ted conferences or the news are too fast you know so i highly recommend speech pool or speech repository for interpreters it's easy to find it in, on in google you know can you type that in the chat please uh, yeah, yeah, we'll do. Okay, one moment. Yeah, okay. Yeah, some some speakers there they don't follow a logical thread, and it's hard to interpret mm -hmm. them because you're not sure what they're talking about. 